Hello and welcome to HBS Pharmacy's webcast lecture. My name is Sally Drake and I'm the Clinical Communications Coordinator at HBS. Attending this session can be used to count towards your CPD points for the purposes of professional registration. But this webcast will focus on lookalike sound alike medications. I'll be discussing some of the risks involved with these medicines, as well as strategies that could be used to prevent or minimise those risks. So lookalike sound alike medications are sometimes known as LASA medicines for short. So they're medication pairs that either look alike when they're written or sound alike when they're spoken. So some examples of a generic LASA pair would be mecaptamine and mecaptopurine, and for brand names, Brentalix and Berlinta. And LASA pairs can also extend to packaging that looks similar. So here we have an example of some lookalike packaging. So this is two different strengths of subtle oral tablets. We've got the 80 milligrams on the left and the 160 milligrams on the right. Um, but at first glance, it would obviously be quite easy to confuse the pair. They um, have very similar branding and colouring and same dimensions of the packaging as well. And the issue of lookalike packaging is not limited to simply different strengths of the same medication. So here we have two different medications. We've got lindocaine and heparin, which obviously have different purposes as well. And um, being produced by the same manufacturer, we can see some quite striking similarities in this packaging. So the boxes are all the same dimension. You've got the same branding, same placement of the, the brand name and the uh, barcode windows there, and also the same color coding for um, the higher strength and the lower strength with the blue and the pink there. Um, and on the right, we've got another example, um, again, with the same brand, but two different antibiotics there. Um, so same artwork, same box dimensions, um, again, quite easy to confuse those pairs. So after seeing those few examples there, it's probably no surprise that LASA medicines are associated with quite a high risk of medication errors. So it's been estimated that these medication types are involved in almost 15% of all medication selection error events. So potential consequences of this include ineffective therapy. So a patient may be given a medication that's not going to be effective for the condition that they suffer from and or the patient may experience adverse effects from a medicine that they were never intended to receive. So that could include uh, hypersensitivity events or drug interactions. So factors that may increase the risk of errors with LASA medications include illegible handwriting, incomplete knowledge of drug names, newly available products, and medications with similar strengths. So when we come to uh, thinking about minimising errors with these products, this really should begin with manufacturers and regulatory bodies when assessing new drug names and packaging for safety. However, there are things that we can do within the clinical environment to improve medication safety in this area. So this requires a uh, multifaceted approach with safety measures in, in, instituted across all ranges of the uh, medication use cycle from procurement all the way through to evaluation. So when we come to procurement, it would be uh, sensible to avoid stocking products with similar packaging. Um, always comparing new packaging with existing items on the inventory. Limit the availability of multiple strengths or forms of the same medicine. And always storing known and potential lastly named pairs in different strengths. Um, so there's an example there of Coumadin and Carvacil. They're obviously in quite similar looking bottles. Um, and from a procurement perspective, it might be worth considering stocking a different brand of cover saw, for instance. And then moving on to storage. 
um, impress list should be tailored to the clinical area area in question. So um, reducing the amount of LASA pairs that aren't relevant to that area. So for example, uh, morphine and hydromorphone can sometimes be uh, confused. And so it might be worthwhile limiting hydromorphone just to specialized uh, pain wards or palliative care areas. Uh, tall man lettering can be used on shelf labels to uh, enhance differentiation between uh, similar looking medication names. Additional warning labels can be used, so that might be in the form of shelf talkers. Um, ensure that all areas um, of storage are of adequate size so that medicines can be stored neatly. Physically separate LASA name pairs, so um, either put them on separate shelves or use shelf dividers. And physically separate different strengths and formulations of the same medication. So for example, uh, modified release preparations should probably be stored separately to the immediate release formulation. Um, so using something like a shelf talker again, so shelf divider. And keep medications in their original packaging. There's quite a number of reasons why that would be important. So the original packaging often has a lot of important information that you don't want to throw away. So regarding uh, storage conditions, um, and it's also often important to protect the medication itself from uh, light or moisture in the air. Um, but it's also really important to uh, enhance differentiation between products. So a lot of tablets are produced in very similar looking foil packaging, foil blister packs, um, and vials and ampules often look a lot more similar once they're removed from their external carton. And always store medication in a way that doesn't impair recognition. So for example, um, smaller products like vials and ampules uh, should avoid storing them uh, in drawers below eye level where the user needs to rely on viewing only the vial cap to identify the product. When it comes to prescribing, all orders really should be clear and complete. And this may include the indication in some instances as well, because this can help to avoid confusion. So most lesser pairs do have different indications. Use of both the brand name and the generic name may also help. And avoid verbal orders wherever possible. Um, if a, an oral order is necessary, it should be communicated clearly along with the indication. And the recipient of the order should repeat the uh, order back. And for sound alike names in particular, spelling out the name can be helpful. And electronic alerts can be used to advise the prescriber of the potential for error. In terms of supply and administration, any order that is ambiguous should always be queried with the prescriber. Um, should identify medications by name and strength, not simply by appearance or location. Always check the appropriateness of therapy for the patient who is in front of you. And carefully review the selected medicine against the original order and the medicine label. Use barcode scanners to verify the correct product has been selected. Carefully review electronic alerts that advise the potential for error. Optimize working environments. So this may include um, things like adequate lighting and ensuring access to current reference texts. And consider interventions that can minimize interruption. So for example, no interruption zones for medication preparation activities and uh, potentially wearing things like do not disturb vests during medication administration rounds. And as always, you should be double checking all medications before administering to the patient and avoid the temptation to rush medication selection and administration tasks. Now, when it comes to patient education, this is a really important step that can help to minimize medication errors. So patients should be encouraged to learn the names of their medications and what they're using them for. 
and patients should also be educated to alert their healthcare professional if a medication appears to be different from what they usually take or if they experience unexpected symptoms. So it's important that patients feel empowered to discuss any concerns that they have with their healthcare provider, as this is one way that we can ensure that any medication error that does occur is identified and resolved in a timely manner. And patients should always be informed when changes occur to the appearance of their medicines. So that just helps to uh, alleviate any anxiety when a patient uh, opens their tablets and it's not what they're expecting to see. And all errors should be evaluated as well as near misses as this is a really good opportunity to learn from mistakes and implement uh, changes to prevent recurrence. So when we look at that whole medication use cycle, we can apply these principles back to our previous example of Covisil and Coumadin. So when it comes to uh, procurement, uh, you might want to consider stocking a different brand of Perindopril. Um, so that would probably be more appropriate than a different brand of Warfarin as they haven't been proven to be bioequivalent. Um, but when it comes to different brands of Covisil, you might be able to uh, procure a product that comes in a box instead, which would really minimise that uh, risk there of selection errors. Um, and it may also be appropriate to consider just not stocking the five milligram presentation of the cover um, but that would really depend on the clinical era, area that you're in. Uh, when it comes to storage, if these products were stored um, in alphabetical order by brand name, they could potentially be next to each other on the shelf. So in that case, it would be useful to use a shelf divider or to simply make sure that they're separated onto the shelf above or below. Um, in most hospital environments, though, they would be stored by generic name and therefore wouldn't be stored next to each other anyway. Um, However, it would be recommended to avoid storing them upright in drawers where you would be relying on just viewing the bottle cap to identify the product. Um, including the indication on a medication order for Coumadin or Covacil could help to overcome this issue of uh, lookalike packaging. Um, and in terms of patient education, Encouraging that communication between patients and healthcare provider can be really important here. Um, as the Covisil 5 milligram and the Coumadin 5 milligram tablets have quite different tablet shapes. So Coumadin is a round tablet, whereas Covisil is a rod shaped tablet. So these quite obvious differences in tablet appearances um, could be useful. So any well informed patient um, may be able to alert their healthcare provider to an error before administration occurs, which would be the ideal outcome there. However, if a, if a medication error does proceed and the patient uh, actually is administered the wrong medication, um, a, a well-informed patient may be more likely to uh, comment to their healthcare provider that they've experienced an unexpected symptom. So if uh, cover still was given in error, some patients do experience a fairly significant first dose effect on their blood pressure. And they may advise their healthcare provider that they're feeling unexpectedly dizzy or lightheaded. Okay, so I mentioned tall man lettering previously as a way to uh, help differentiate between LASA pairs. So this is a, a system of selective capitalization, which helps to make differentiation easier. So the differences between similar drug names are highlighted by capitalizing on the dissimilar letters. So in the example of dactinomycin and daptomycin, you would be highlighting those different letters there, as you can see. And the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare has developed the National Tall Man Lettering List. So this, this list contains name pairs that would benefit the most from the use of tall man lettering. And some examples are shown here. Um, so things like Actinel and Actos, 
Prograf and Prozac. And then you have some medications that actually have more than one potential confusing pair. So Lamictal with Lacactal as well as Lamazole and Vimblastine, Vincristine and Venerelbine. So medication pairs predicted to present the greatest risk to patient safety are included on this list. Um, the list is certainly not exhaustive of all potentially confusable products as the commission advises that overuse of tall man lettering may actually reduce its effectiveness um, as the names no longer appear novel. So as a general rule, whenever tall man lettering is encountered, it should serve as a warning that the medication in question is potentially able to be confused. And I touched on indication briefly before, as many LASA pairs do have quite different indications. Therefore, adding the purpose to the order may be useful to prevent confusion there. So for example, propranolol would be much less likely to be confused with uh, propofol if the indication of hypertension was included on the order. However, this is not going to prevent all errors with LASA medications, as some LASA pairs do actually have the same indication and yet can still cause serious harm to the patient. So for example, morphine and hydromorphone, uh, they're both opioids, they're both indicated for the management of severe pain. However, hydromorphone is approximately eight times as potent as morphine. So if hydromorphone was accidentally given to a patient at the dose that was intended for morphine, an overdose situation is quite likely. Um, so the patient could experience excessive sedation, respiratory depression, um, and it could also potentially be a life-threatening uh, adverse event. And drug strengths can also be confused. So in particular, medication strengths that differ by a factor of 10. So for example, adrenaline 0 0.1 and one milligram per mil and premipexol 375 micrograms and 3.75 milligrams. So the uh, Institute for Safe Medicine Practices has issued a, an alert on this issue um, as it has received multiple reports of errors with uh, tacrolimus 0 0.5 milligrams and five milligrams. And in some cases, patient harm has resulted. So strategies that can be used to prevent this type of error is to always use leading zeros for doses that are less than one unit. So tacrolimus 0 0.5 milligrams should never be written as 0.5 milligrams, as that could quite easily be confused for five milligrams. And conversely, uh, trailing zeros should never be used. So five milligrams should never be written as 5.0 milligrams, because that could be confused for 550 milligrams. And where possible, barcode scanners can be used to minimise these uh, errors, as well as limiting the range of concentrations available as appropriate to the clinical location. So the consequences of these medication errors really depends on quite a number of factors. So firstly, the toxicity of the drug that is administered. So for example, if Coumadin was administered instead of Carvacil, it could potentially result in a um, significant bleeding event. And you also need to consider the consequences of failing to treat the condition that the drug was originally prescribed for. So for a patient uh, with epilepsy who was prescribed Lamictal but accidentally received Lamisole, this could potentially result in an increase in seizure activity. And you would also need to consider the time elapsed before the error has been discovered and the reversibility of any harm once the error is realised. So to summarise, medication errors with losses are quite common um, and can be minimised by an, a good knowledge of drug names that look and sound alike. And other strategies that can be used to prevent these errors include carefully checking each order, utilising barcode scanning technology where available, matching the drug to the indication, confirming any order that is unclear, and ensuring that medication storage areas are kept clear and organised. 
So that concludes today's session. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and found it valuable to your practice. If you do have any questions or any feedback, please contact me directly at sally.drake at hps.com.au. Thank you for your time and I hope that you can join us for our next webcast presentation.